How can we make the world better? By making ourselves better. The Dr. Joe Show explores how you can make positive personal change by using his groundbreaking and highly effective I Am approach to understand who we are and why we do what we do. Your small changes can have big effects. Join us now for the Dr. Joe Show with Mark Stiles of Stiles Law, Thomas McCoy, and your host, Dr. Joe Schrand. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Dr. Joe Show. Oh, yes. We've got some smoking stuff tonight. We've got some really interesting, interesting guest tonight. Tom, could you introduce our two guests for the Dr. Joe show tonight? Oh, absolutely. Our two guests. She is an anti-vaping activist, a proponent of children's health, and founder of apparel company Sportobin. He is a veteran publishing executive with over 40 years in the education industry. He's a member of the Screen Actors Guild and the father of two adult children and two adoring granddaughters. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Tobin and Joe Collymore. Uh, welcome, welcome, folks, to the Dr. Joe Show. I'm so excited to have you here. Uh, let's let's just get right to it. Lori, tell us a little bit about why you're here, what we're talking about tonight. Well, we're here because I started a, a documentary called Taking a Toke, and it's about the evils of teen vaping and how it impacts their health and their families. And so I'm here to talk about that tonight, Joe and I both are. Thank you so much for having us, too. We really appreciate it. Oh, it's, we're delighted to have you guys here. And like I said, it, it's such an important topic because it is affecting millions and millions of our kids. Joe, how did you get involved in this? Well, I got involved because I was, I'm with uh, Harbor Media in uh, Hingham, which is a hyper-local community access television studio, of which I'm a producer there. And Lori is one of our members. And so she came into the studio one afternoon and speaking with our executive director was very passionate about wanting to tell a story about the dangers of vaping, especially among our adolescents. And I just couldn't say no. That's terrific. Well, I, you may not have been able to say no to Lori, but I sure hope by the end of this, our adolescents are able to say no to vaping. So uh, <laughs> let's, let's go right there. Lori, how, how did this all get started? What happened? Well, I smoked as a kid, and I quit when I was 25, and I have two parents that died from tobacco. My mother had lung cancer, and my father had some complications from his lungs because of it. And this, this nicotine tobacco addiction, it's just, it's, it's horrible. It's absolutely horrible that they're actually found a way to come after the kids. So that's, that's part of it. Yeah. Yeah. So very personal in some ways. Yes, exactly, exactly. I was a kid that, you know, that's what you did back then. If your parents smoked, you smoked. Mm. And you could buy cigarettes back then, and they were like a dollar. So, anyways, yeah. And um, my next, I started teaching an exercise class at my son's grammar school when he was in second grade. And so I taught it all the way till last year when COVID hit. They closed the school, so I stopped teaching it. So I taught it for 12 years. And I noticed some of my former students walking around the town of Hall vaping. And that's when I, I went up to Harbor Media and started doing something. Because I coached kids. I taught them. I care about these kids. And it's just absolutely horrible that these children have been duped into vaping and, you know, the tobacco industry. So that's where it all kind of began. Yeah, interesting. So interesting. And Joe, tell me a bit about, we'll get into the nitty gritty about the production part. So how does someone produce a documentary like this? Uh, well, it's definitely not easy. And, and this is still a work in progress. Um, and most importantly is it's telling a story. Most successful and impactful documentaries focus on one or more individuals that tells a very powerful story. And what this story is about is what I would characterize as the big lie. Mm. Insofar as the tobacco industry, the e-vaping industry sold us a bill of goods, thinking that this was safe, it was an alternative to combustible cigarettes, and we found out that was a lie. Not the first time. 
that uh, mm -hmm. that there have been big industry lies. But why do you think this one, no pun intended, caught on so much? Lori, what do you think? Why why did vaping catch on? Because it was cool. They pushed it out on social media. It, they can take these little devices and make smoke rings, and everybody's doing it to be cool. And then bullying came into play. Kids were bullying other kids to try it. It only took one pod to get a kid addicted. That's all it takes for their frontal lobes, the endorphin kick. So, terrible. Yeah, so so it is true that the nicotine addiction is, is certainly one of the three things that leads to potentially lifelong addiction, nicotine, mm -hmm. marijuana, and alcohol. And, you know, the fact that these things are legal, I just want people to know, doesn't mean they're safe. You know, guns are legal as well. Cars are legal as well. Prescription pain medicine is legal, but it doesn't necessarily make it safe. And that's part of, I think, what the, the challenge is, is how do we communicate this? Especially, you know, Lori, you're talking about when you were a kid, your parents were smoking. Yeah. So it just, you know, this is sort of the, the modeling that a lot of parents do for their kids without even realizing it. Yeah. Not even realizing it. So let's, let's talk more about this what did you learn i mean who you, you say joe that there, there are stories yeah. so tell us about the story a little bit who are we following in this well we're still developing um the story is the first thing but some of the individuals whom we've had the the honor of meeting and talking to and interviewing um just literally brings you to tears when you hear mm -hmm. a parent's anguish when they discover uh, in their child's uh, dresser drawer a shoebox full of empty pods. Um, the anguish of a young man who so desperately wants to quit this addiction that he actually went out and he bought a lockbox that you program the timer so that it locks him away from getting access to his vaping pen it's it he's trying to ration himself in a way that he can try to kick the addiction when you see people go to those lengths when you see that kind of emotional and psychological and physical pain it, it just blows your mind yeah it, it certainly is a pernicious addiction and habit and more could you just go over some of that again how you got the kids Okay, so um, I have a big mouth. <laughs> I know a lot of people. And so I'm always asking if anybody wants to talk to us about it and or if their kids want to talk to us about it. That's been tough because kids can't be on or in a documentary unless they're 18 and they can, you know, a lot of kids' parents don't know they're vaping. So you mm -hmm. can't have them on. You need parental consent. But they're really good at hiding it in their sleeves and hiding it so parents don't know that they're vaping. Parents don't want to talk about it because it's painful. They've been duped. They were told this was safe. It's not safe. So I found a few people that would talk with us, a mother and a son, but they wanted to be incognito. They didn't want anybody to know who they are. They're hiding their identities. Uh, you just have to go with what you can. We have another gentleman we are going to be interviewing, and he lives you know, in Michigan, so we'll be going out to interview him after I get some COVID shots, because I'm not going to go out until I get some COVID shots. But you just keep asking and you just keep, you know, keep plugging away. You get somebody. So, so did you find that the kids didn't want to talk because they didn't want their parents to know? And granted, you know, we can't get minors, you know, to, to yeah, be on yeah. shows like this without parental permission. Was it that? And then, and then this mom and, and son, was it the stigma that was associated with this? as well joe you're nodding your head yeah, so is it the stigma the stigma and i think for the the young people that we were interviewing um they didn't want to be identified because they knew they were going to be you know ridiculed by their peers mm -hmm. um, it's incredible just how insidious this addiction is to the point where the kids know they're addicted but they don't want to be alone in their addiction so they're going to ridicule someone trying to get a, to, to break the habit. Mm -hmm. Huh. Interesting. So this is a peer pressure as well. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. 
Yep. And now you know, it gets crazier, Dr. Joe. Think about this. We're in the middle of a pandemic. You got kids that are, you know, remote learning, isolating at home with addictions. Oh, yes. And I believe that uh, the CDC uh, recently shared last year those who were still actively vaping were five times more likely to get COVID than those who were not vaping. Well, that's an interesting piece of data. Of course, it, it makes sense, doesn't it? You know, if you're ingesting something into your lungs. That's really interesting. Here's the big misnomer. Why they come up with the term vaping? It's that's vaporizing and that's not vaping. What you're really doing is you may as well just take a can of hairspray and and just mm -hmm. sort of like do like you would do with whipped cream. Yeah, aerosol. Aerosol. So how did you guys do some of the research on this? I mean, you're you're talking about a lot of of sort of granular psychobiology here and neurobiology. Where'd you where'd you get your research, Lori? Well, we read about stuff, and also I have a teenage son who I could talk to about things, so I, I knew some of the things that were going on. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, just walking down the street, you could see kids vaping. That's one thing. Dr. Jonathan Whitcock, Whitcock is from um, Mass General, and he's also a, he's a pediatrician there, and he's also a Harvard professor. And he was wonderful. He gave us a lot of wonderful information. Um, Maura Healy was amazing. She gave us a whole bunch. She taught us a lot of things as well. I'm sure Joe has some pointers on that one too. Mm -hmm. There's also an organization called Parents Against Vaping. Um, they shared some information with us. We did the good old fashioned uh, research online, uh, particularly with respect to, if you recall back in uh, in early 2020, when the nation began to see this spike in uh, vaping-related deaths, and the feeling was that some of these pods were coming from the black market, you know, someone making this these uh, chemicals in their backyard, and it was killing some of our young people. Mm -hmm. And uh, following this trail just opened up so many doors. We talked with dentists. Uh, neurologists, um, child psychologists, pediatricians, uh, dare officers in the schools, just amazing stories that they shared with us about, you know, like whack-a-mole, how do you track down and, mm -hmm. and tamp down uh, these young people who are actively vaping? It's a powerful, powerful trailer. How do people get to see the rest of it? We, uh, we have to finish the film. We're about 80% done with filming. It's editing and uh, fundraising so that we can create the money to do that. So we're still, we're still finishing it up. But one of the things that we do want to share with our audience is that uh, Lori and I recently decided to the extent possible using uh, virtual uh, platforms like Zoom to share what we've already gathered uh, and to share that with um, uh, parent organizations in the schools, uh, community health departments and the like, we want to help continue to build awareness again in the middle of this, this pandemic because we have young people who are suffering in silence. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the silence is in part because of the stigma or because their parents don't know and they're afraid. What do you think all the silence is? Or is it that, that we as the adults just don't get it yet? What do you think? How do we, how do we not only tease that apart, but how do we get the parents who actually, let me just ask this, who's the audience for this? Who, who should be listening to this? This is really Everybody. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, uh, everybody should be um, parents, educators. We also need legislators. And we also want the kids. So it's oh, yes. short. It's going to be about 45 minutes long. And but it's supposed to, everybody should be able to watch it because it'll get something, everybody will get something out of it. This is great. So, so you're like right in the midst of it. How can people get involved at this point? 
Well, so? they can donate. Or, go ahead. Well, that's true. <laughs> they, they can donate. So, well, we also go, to, go to the website, takingatoke.com. Um, on that landing site, they can contribute, whether their time, money, and their testimony. We still want to hear from people who have a story to, to tell. We have a central character that we're developing. We won't go into too much detail on that. But there are what I would call a, a cast of supporting characters. And everybody has an authentic experience that is worthy of, of sharing with us. And we want to give them that opportunity, whether they want to sit in front of the camera or we'll have them in silhouette so that they're able to speak their truth and still maintain their anonymity. Hmm. What are, what are, yeah, what are the most common health concerns that are facing these kids when they first start using and maybe go six months to a year? What are, what are they seeing? Well, the first is respiratory. Uh, and you, here's what's really crazy. Um, last year, 2020, when uh, we had these deaths around the United States uh, and Congress was, was getting pressured to do something. Um, and what happened was they got the tobacco industry who's behind these vaping products to eliminate certain flavors, mango, watermelon, blueberry, pop, you know, bubble gum. But they lobbied, they lobbied Congress to keep mint. Why? Why? <laughs> exactly, why? Well, we found out because mint kind of sort of freezes your mouth in such a way that the vaping mm -hmm. product freezes your throat so that the vaping product gets to your frontal cortex and you are almost instantaneously addicted. So let me just clarify this for a moment in terms of the part of the brain. So the nicotine is affecting the limbic system. The prefrontal cortex is also being affected based on what you're saying. So tell me, tell me this understanding because my understanding of addiction is um, the prefrontal cortex is impacted because it is taken over by the addiction. It's not able to then really begin to assess what will happen next if I keep doing this now. Um, so there is, uh, people need to understand the risk, not just for the adults because of the lungs, but in kids, this is one of the gateways to lifelong addiction and then a progression to other drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and people don't always think they'd say, oh, what, what is, you know, it's just nicotine. No. It is the beginning. L Laura, you want to comment on this? Yes. Okay. So now they have these things called dab pens. The dab pens are THC. Well, kids are already used to vaping. So the dab pen is just another vape to them. And there are a lot of kids that have been using these, thinking it's nicotine, but it's THC. Yeah. And they end up in the hospital because some of them are on medicine for ADD. We had the D.A.R.E. officer in giving us this story that was just like, oh, my goodness. So it's really dangerous because if you're already vaping, what's the difference if you're vaping THC or something else? And kids are passing stuff out. They don't know what's what. And so it becomes very dangerous. This is also a very, very potent tobacco. The tobacco is, um, they do something with the acid in the tobacco, makes it really, really, really strong and powerful. And that's why it takes only a little bit of this to get you addicted and hit the frontal lobe and hit the endorphins. So it's just, people don't understand that it's not like a cigarette, way, way, way stronger. It absolutely is. Um, we can we can talk a little bit about about some of the understanding of, of the neuroscience of this in a bit, but let's just stick with the idea that kids are susceptible to being addicted, and what can happen next is that they can then move on to other drugs. And people certainly understand a nicotine addiction you know, because they've they've seen it, but they do not understand marijuana and THC addiction, which is also incredibly addictive it's just that people don't recognize it because they don't have the same sort of withdrawal but now with like one of the things i like to say with the stuff that's going around around now 
this ain't your grandfather's weed. Mm -mm. I mean, this, this is like Strong. so much stronger in the THC. Um, we, you know, we'll, we'll have another show at some point about CBD stuff, but we're talking now really about nicotine and how addictive it is. And you guys know the numbers, right? You start using drugs or alcohol, which includes nicotine, after the age of 21, one out of 25 people are at risk for lifelong addiction. You start using before the age of 18, and that means using anything before the age of 18. That number goes from one in 25 to one in four. I just want people to understand that, that your kids are at risk for addiction, lifelong addiction, one out of four of them. I don't know which one, you don't know which one. And so for the parents out there, don't be angry with your kid about this. Because if you're angry, you're going to shut them down. Mm -hmm. They're not going to come to you because they're, they'll think they're going to get punished. They think they're going to get their cell phone taken away. They'll think they're going to get something removed. That is not the way to help your kids. I'm curious about the interview that you have had with the mom and her son. What what were they talking about? What was the content? Can you give some of that away, Joe? So we we interviewed the mom first, and she shared her anguish, and then she shared her anger. Because like most parents who are aware that perhaps their teenagers might be experimenting with cigarettes, and so they were duped into thinking by the industry that e-cigarettes vaping was a safer alternative, might even have been a pathway to smoking cessation. And this mother bought into that narrative, only to find out later that her son was addicted in a big time way. And then we interviewed the son, and we found out that he has a brother younger than him who still is actively vaping as we speak. So here's the older brother trying to kick the habit while the younger brother is still active. And then you've got all kinds of tension playing out in the family. It's just heartbreaking, uh, the amount of uh, damage, if you will, emotional, psychological, sociological damage that occurs when this type of addiction is at play in homes. Uh, and I don't think people appreciate it because it's just nicotine, right? And that's, that's sort of the mindset, and it is not just nicotine. Lori, what, what's the experience like been for you just being with these people and, and, and having this mission? Well, it's sad for these kids. You really, really feel so horrible for these kids and these families. And it, it makes me angry because, you know, I mean, this was, oh, my gosh, many, many years ago when I smoked it and I kicked it. But it was just regular cigarettes, nothing like what they have now. So you just feel for these families and these kids and... It's so sad. I mean, kids in school are afraid to use the bathrooms because kids are in there vaping. And if you get caught and somebody's been vaping, they pull them all into the office and they all get in trouble. So in the bullying that goes on, too, I've heard some really horrible bullying stories. Older kids bullying eighth graders to vape. So it's just, it's awful. It's awful. So what's, what's the psychology behind that, do you think? I mean, I know I'm the psychiatrist, but I'm going to ask anyway. So why would an older kid bully and intimidate another kid to vape? Joe, got some thoughts on that? Well, we heard one interesting dynamic at play, and that is the older kids get the, little, the younger ones interested so that that's cultivating another level of consumer. Hmm. That way, the older kid can sell to the younger ones, and that proceeds help support the older one's habit. Oh. You want to expand on that, Lori, or what's your take on it? It's partly that. And um, I, I just think, and it, it could be because I was before the Internet, but I think there's bullying that goes on because of social media, and I think it's commonplace. I think kids are meaner these days. I really do. And so I think it's just commonplace. Kids get bullied online, and then why not just bully another kid? Because, you know, it's a younger kid. Get them to be in with our group. They have to vape. You have to be part of one of, be one of the cool kids if you vape. And if you don't vape, you're not cool. So... What do you think, Dr. Joe? Do you think um, there's a there's a component 
of what we were talking about earlier that those that are addicted they don't want to let them out because they 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 want to share in the pain right is that maybe why they're bringing in some new ones to say like i don't want to be alone in this let's or you know i want more people to feel this pain i mean do the kids realize they're addicted no no they don't this is great we've got a no and a yes great Go uh -huh. ahead, i think it depends on your age <laughs> the older ones they know they're addicted and they don't care and laurie you think no yeah. well from what i when we interviewed Kristen. Um, her son did not believe he was addicted. They had to have proof positive that he's destroying his lungs, that he got kicked off his hockey team, all these things. And then finally, he would admit that he had an addiction because they don't want to admit they're addicted. Right. And, but understand is, is, is different. The question is, you know, early on, do they realize what's happening to them? Or do they think, ah, it's fun, it tastes good, it's... It's cool. I can hide it from my parents because it's it vaporizes into the into the air. They don't even know. They can walk in my room five minutes later and they won't know. But it's exciting. Do they do they sometimes confuse the excitement with the addiction? Addiction? Probably. That's scary. Yeah. yeah. Are you are you interviewing kids who are vaping and they have no intention of stopping? Yes. And how, how is it to be with them? I mean, just as an adult, what's that experience like sitting with a kid like this? It's surreal. Because um, you know that they may end up paying a price down the road. Mm -hmm. And because you're older than they are, they're just going to dismiss anything you have to say. So you just... You feel you feel helpless. Yeah, yeah, and you know, it's a it's a really important word to feel helpless, because on some level, I think what you're maybe picking up on is the unconscious of the child, who without wanting to admit it, also feels helpless. That's part of what the addiction is. Mm -hmm. So you may feel helpless as an adult; you can't get through to this kid, but I. I work with a lot of kids like this. And on some level, when they realize that they're addicted, it is overwhelming. And that is part of what they have been denying. You know, one of our phrases in psychiatry, denial is not just a river in Egypt. You know, it's, it's really that I, I don't want to look at this. And part of why they don't want to look at this is the helplessness and then the stigma that goes along with it and all the other things. But here's, here's one of the techniques that, uh, we use is we say to a kid, okay, so if you're not addicted, would you know, stop. And I say, oh, no, I don't want to. I say, well, is it that you don't want to or you can't? He says, no, I don't want to. I say, well, why don't you want to? I really like it. Well, well, tell me more about that. You really like it. What does it do? And then they begin to explain this, you know, this pleasure that they get even if it's momentary. And then we can talk with them about, well, if you need the pleasure of the nicotine, what is really going on in your life then that you can't find pleasure somewhere else? What, what's happening? And eventually they begin to realize that some of the vaping, the using, is the barrier to their real relationship with other people, where the real pleasure really is. Um, so we got, we got, you know, a lot of kids who I'll say, okay, so let me, especially when, when we had our, our inpatient unit, we, we didn't, you know, it wasn't like we got kids who were there at Castle when Castle existed for vaping, but they were still addicted to nicotine. So many of them, whether it was vaping, because vaping was just coming out or smoking, but they didn't consider it such a big deal because they were trying to get off these other drugs. Uh, and that, unfortunately, is still part of the culture. And we call it harm reduction, but it's not really harm reduction at all. It is still powerful. If you are addicted to a substance, you can say, all right, so let me just see. So you're, you're in a 
a treatment program. Your parents are really angry with you. You've been getting kicked out of school. Uh, you can't stop smoking. Uh, you say you don't want to, but uh, now, now I, I guess you don't have a problem. That's true. And they just sort of like, you know, they, they sort of take that in. But, you know, it's, it's such important work. And it, it, it really does speak to how susceptible our community is to marketing. Because that's really what you're talking about. For those, for those WATD viewers, please go to Take a Toke site and look at the video clip because you'll see the ads that the marketers were using to try to entice young kids mm -hmm. um, in the guise of saying, well, this is just for adults. Those, those, I'm not sure many adults would like, oh, well, that's a really interesting picture of a young kid smoking. Why would that appeal to an adult? But it's just a little older than the target age, isn't it? Mm -hmm. A little older than that target age. You know, I remember when vaping first came in on the scene, and it was it was definitely uh, messaged as a safer alternative to cigarettes and and the smoking cessation. I remember a friend of mine um, was opening a vape shop for the purpose of helping people slowly downgrade their intake of nicotine, and I, I don't know how that went for him, but. Um, that was the messaging in the beginning, and there goes the slippery slope. You know, this yeah. technology is so new. It still is. I mean, if you do the research on it, I believe vaping sort of came onto the consumer marketplace about maybe 15 years ago, which really isn't a lot of time when you're mm -hmm. talking about the impact on human health. And what are some of the real bad health I mean, I heard popcorn lung is one. I mean, obviously, it, it takes time to see historically what the effects are going to be. But what, what are we starting to see right now? Well, popcorn lung was one of the first things that uh, doctors began to see. And, of course, when the word got out, oh, my gosh, uh, this vaping pen is inflaming the lung sacs. So guess what the industry did? They tweaked the they tweak the chemistry of the pod contents and the temperature of the heating element just enough so that it wasn't causing popcorn lung anymore. That's, that's like crazy that you could just sort of calibrate just enough to get under the radar so you're not inflaming the lung sacs per se. But what are the long-term effects? We still don't know because, again, this technology is so new. Think about when the cigarettes first came on uh, and how it, long it took before, you know, lung cancer began to manifest in such a way that the tobacco industry suddenly was the big bad wolf. Right. And the ads back then, the Marlboro Man, you know, how cool it was to smoke. And, mm -hmm. you know, and then remember, remember the ad that came out? years and years later of basically was the Marlboro man on his horse, almost like with a ventilator, you know, just couldn't breathe. Lori, when we were off air, we were talking about um, new ones that have come out that are, that are less expensive and how are kids, you know, getting the money to get these things. Want to tell us a bit more about that? Yes. Yeah, so they, they're called disposables and there's all different kinds of brands and they every time you turn around it's whack-a-mole there's another new brand but they're about fifteen dollars so kids who are younger in junior high they don't have jobs but you know grandma gives them money for their birthday or their holidays and so they're able to get their get their uh, fix get their addiction um vaping from you know something that is throwaway you get like i don't know it's is joe is it like 600 hits or something like that or 60 hits off of one of these disposables and then they throw them away and so it's not as expensive as it was it's a little less expensive now puff bar was another one that came out and when that came out i had someone working with me and she said oh you need to let mara healy know about this company so we did we let um her assistant know and didn't mara sue them so she won. So there's just so many different names and kids 
they're very devious. They'll have stuff, they'll order it online, have it sent to the neighbor's house, go get it. Or, you know, older people from what um, our, our gentleman that came and spoke with us said, there's these older people that are buying a ton of stuff online and turning around and reselling it to kids. So they're dealing, they're illegal dealers. And Joe will probably remember that a little better than me because he asked him all the questions. Joe? Yeah, there, there are these nefarious individuals out there. It's almost like Breaking Bad, where once they understand the chemistry and the technology, um, they're able to recycle these pods. And so you've got like neighborhood craft pods. And as you heard Lori share, you know, dab pens. So now they're mixing up their own brew uh, that these kids are using. When we talk about in drugstore theater, the kids... Um We'll talk about jewels and vaping, and they'll talk about this um, aircraft, the ICER. Do you know about that? Like, that's one of the the constituents of the, uh, the actual product that pushes the stuff out is uh, the same thing that's used to de-ice the wings of airplanes. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, Heather, in particular, made one of her areas of expertise and. She'll say, so folks, that's that's basically what you're doing. You're inhaling the same thing to de-ice the wings of an airplane. Do you think that could be having an effect on your lungs? Mark, Mark, you got a couple of questions about this or no, I was I was queuing you up to make sure that you asked Ask the two questions, of course, because <laughs> we only have a few minutes left. Thank you. You know, folks, where would I be without Mark and Tom, my co-host? So you know, we talk about the I am approach, which is the idea that we're all doing the best we can at every moment in time. And that includes the kids who are vaping. You know, if you think about this, you put something into the biological domain of your lungs, you're going to change their environment and you're going to change their response. And that's what happens. It doesn't always mean it's good, but it is the best that lung can do. So the I am four domains, your home domain, the social domain, biological domain and the I see, how I see myself, how I think other people see me. And we've actually been talking about all four of these domains tonight. We've spoken about the kids' secrecy at home, the peer pressure in their social domain, the way they see themselves and the way they fear other people see them, which is stigma, and then the effect on their lungs. Small changes can have big effects. So I'm going to ask you first, Lori, and then go to you, Joe. What small change can you recommend to our listening audience so that we can manage this vaping? Well, I would say get involved. Parents, if you're seeing windows open in the middle of winter, that means your kid's probably doing something. So start, the small changes is when the kid's in school or not home, go through their rooms. That's, that's your property. You need to know. You do. You need to know what they're up to because sometimes they don't, they don't know what they're doing. They still need you to be their parent. Joe, small changes can have big effects. What small change can you recommend to our listeners? I'd like to speak to the parents, and, and that is to suggest they take the time to really sit down and have a, a calm, non-lecturing kind of conversation with their child or any small child that's, that's in their, you know, their family nucleus. Um, that child could be vaping, and they're afraid, they're ashamed, and just having a very non-judgmental type of conversation might be just the thing to make a difference in that child's life. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with, with both of you. The parents, it's your absolute prerogative to go and figure out what's going on in your kid's room or wherever. And Joe, you're absolutely right. If, if you approach a kid with anger or judgment, don't be surprised if they put up a wall. But one of the things parents need to know is this kid would not be keeping it a secret from you if they didn't care what you thought. They still care what you think. That's why they're keeping it secret or else they'd be doing it right in front of you. Which gets to the second point. Because everyone is interested in what other people think or feel about them, and you're part of someone's home or social domain, and affect the way they think and feel about themselves, which has an effect on their brain, this means you control no one, but you influence everyone. You get to choose the kind of influence you want to be. Joe, this time we're going to start with you. 
What kind of influence are you hoping to be on our communities? The best word I could think of is to facilitate knowledge transfer, to share what information we have, and to make it available so that someone else is empowered with the same information we have. Wow. I mean, I mean that's news. And that we all actually understand the same thing, but that's another show. Lori, how about you? Mine would be, it, it's my purpose, and I try to do this every day, is to educate, inspire, create, connect with children and families for the highest good of all concern. So I'm always taking action on that every day. So that's, that's where I'm at. Wonderful. Folks, this has been really important. I hope people understand that nicotine is a danger. Vaping is a danger. danger. Help your kids out. Talk with them calmly. That's what it's about. Thanks so much for coming on the show tonight, folks. We'll see you all next week here at the Dr. Joe Show. Good night, everybody.